filled with happiness to introduce my gorgeous friend, Lori Verba, this evening. I'm going to read a little about Lori, but I have to say I knew Lori's work probably in the mid 2000s. I started seeing her work appear in various publications, maybe in Shots Magazine. I can't remember exactly. And I remember being at Photo Lucida with my portfolio box. And maybe it was 2008. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just guessing. And there was kind of a flurry in the, um, in the reception area. And this woman walked through with this spiky blonde hair and a motorcycle jacket. And it was like, who is that rock star of photography? And I, I remember like all these male curators sort of trailing after her. Now, I could be wrong, but that's my memory. And I have just never forgotten that moment, but I've, I've, I realized I was looking on Lens Scratch today. I think I've written about Lori's work maybe six times over the years. And in 2014, I went to a wonderful photo festival in uh, Zebulon, Georgia, a town of maybe 12 buildings. And Lori and her artist compadres, her posse, as we call it, put on the most amazing, innovative exhibition in a horse barn. And that completely turned me on my head about how photography can be seen and ways of working. And it was just, it was just such an exciting exhibition. And then I left the barn and there was Lori with her guitar singing. And I, I don't know, it's just like one of those, and the whole place had string lights and it was this magical evening. And I realized that she is way more than just an artist. She is such an innovator. And um, I feel so lucky to call her a friend. So Lori is a self-taught photo-based artist with a home studio in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I have to say, this is one of the most humble bios for someone who has achieved so much. I told you I hate writing them. I would rather I, write an artist statement. I know. Her imagery and assemblage is rooted in themes of memory, illusion, loss, and revival with the Southern sensibilities of storytelling. Her work is held in permanent and private collections throughout the world. Lori has curated several exhibitions, including Tribe for the Talk Fox Talbot Museum in 2018, that's in England. Her first monograph, The Mothwing Diaries, <clears throat> was named one of the top 10 photo books of 2015 by American Photo Magazine. She is also co-founder of Pigs Fly Retreats. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Lori Verba. Thank you. I would just like for you to go anywhere with me and um, that was it that made me feel good and it makes me feel like I'm ready to roll here and thank you Aileen and LA Center is being really good to me this year I have to say and it feels frightening but amazing and um, I am honored to have this chance and to anyone who's sitting down to sit through this you know I it's a privilege that you would just show up and look at at my work and listen to what I have to say and just take your time um, here. It means a lot to me. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Every one of you. Um, okay, I have to get ready for screen share and all this business, don't I? Do I? Yeah. Do we want to fire it off that fast or do we want to, uh, do you want to chat a bit? It's your call. I, let's start off by talking about the wall behind you. <laughs> this gives us a little insight into your way of bringing 
it's kind of like the whole world under the wall with well i'm i do want to say not every wall in my house looks like that so but what this is really my office although the office keeps growing um but you know it, it things change that wall will, will look entirely different probably two weeks from now and i also i'm really um like to be visually stimulated i'm completely affected by my surroundings um and i can get i can be digging into an idea and it is utter chaos and it just spreads and and i'll get through that creative burst and then you know it takes days to start to put it back together again in some way where you could work from it but this is kind of a play wall for me so sometimes the whole body of work comes home and the whole thing hangs there um but i don't know i like mixing it up this room to me kind of feels like a walk-in assemblage anything's kind of give it a try see what fits together well i think that's a perfect lead-in to your work excellent um well, and yeah, in this sense, um, I'll, I, I am going to let everybody know, I'm going to hop around um, because I want to cover is I really want to talk about my work. We can talk about my history and other things I do in my life when we're having a conversation, but I want to show you as much work as I can in 30 minutes. And so I hope y'all can hang with me. Um, I need to do my job, which is get I go to the green share screen first. Make sure you don't click on Zoom when you get onto your screen. Okay, we're looking good. Then this, then share, then this is the biggie. Go to play. Mm-hmm. There you go. We're in business. All right, you're in business, Lori. Okay. Um, so, because I am self-taught, I suppose that that has allowed me um, some wild freedom in um, in what I'm willing to try. You know, without a formal art education. Uh, there's no, there are no rules for me, and I certainly teach myself as much as possible, but I'm pretty free when it comes to um, trying things that are not just stri straight photography. And um, video is certainly one of them, I, and I do not call myself um, a videographer, or um, I, and I try not to take it too seriously, because it's a great icebreaker for me when I'm stuck creatively um, with self-doubt, I'll sit down and make a little film and it's visually, you know, gets all the things going and, and then I'm off to the races. So I'm gonna just open tonight with a short video and um, it, it'll be our icebreaker and we'll get us a groove on here. So here we go. Oh, 
Okay, now I'm ready. Um, so my first focus project was safekeeping. And somewhere in 2008, 2009 is when I started on it. My children were really young, I have three children. And um, I had always been intrigued by the phrase for safekeeping. That would always stop me when I would be reading that. And I, that happened one night and I thought, well, what is it that I, what is it that I think of as being precious and um, something that I want to protect? And how would I represent that visually? And so I thought about innocence. Relationships. Spirituality. Secrets. Contentment. My memory. So and I also really appreciated the fact that, you know, a photograph actually is safekeeping, um, that it holds this parcel of time. So that was, um, that was big for me to, to dedicate myself and, and uh, try and make 20 good pictures within one idea. So a few years went by and there were other projects, but Drunken Poets Dream rocked my world um, in a few ways. And it came about, um, I heard Ray Wiley Hubbard's song, Drunken Poets Dream. He's one of my favorite Texas artists. And I love the song, but those three words, I couldn't get them out of my head. And they, because I couldn't believe they could be so tragic and also so wonderful, really at the exact same time. I thought that's just fascinating. And, and so I got started just to see where it would go. And, you know, I was not so far into it before I realized that actually almost everything I could think of that was significant about my life or that mattered to my life, that that was true of, you know, that um, being an artist is uncomfortable and beautiful. Loving someone is uncomfortable and beautiful. Um, having children is uncomfortable and beautiful. And so that's when I knew I could really sink into it and spend some time with it. This one's called the I Remember You. And then a really crazy thing happened. This was an image I'd made many years earlier. It's called Pissed Off Ballerina. She, I had had a big print of that on my desk. I don't know why. It was um, in my office one day. And I'd been working on Drunk and Poet Stream, and I had gone to a sporting goods store and bought all of their bird wings. Sporting goods stores sell whole, intact, beautiful, perfect bird wings. When someone told me that, I went and bought all of them. And I came home, and I was so lit up, excited to make a photograph. It was like I... I had to make a photograph like an emergency and no one was around and I had no good ideas. And I walked into my office and it was just like out of, 
it seems ridiculous to say this, but it was out of body because I just didn't even think about it. I just gravitated over to that print and I laid the wings down on the print and went and got the Hasselblad and stood over it and made the image. And it was just, you know, I ran the film that night and I showed it to a friend and he told me he thought it was stupid. And I thought, man, I, I don't. And, um, I, and I'm really excited about it. So I just got up the next morning and kept going. And I spent all day combining objects and my own photographs and coming up with a new narrative for this new image using a mediocre landscape, but with this child's you know, science experiment. This one's called Moral Compass, by the way. And it was, utterly thrilling and I did it for many many months and it was just one of the most joyful times of my creative life because it felt like anything was possible. This one's Save Yourself. Stage Fright. And then this happened. Um, this is an important image for me. I think it's, it's a bit of a departure, um, but not to, to me. I think visually, maybe some people think it is, but um, this was my father's typewriter. His mother gave it to him when he was a boy. It was his first typewriter. And he grew up to be a journalist and an editor um, and a writer. And he died of a heart attack at 43, and I was 20. And I've had the typewriter with me since then. And I've always wanted to photograph it, but I, I wanted to do it respectfully and as a portrait of him really. And so the day that, that I got this, I, it made me really happy and relieved to have it because it felt to me like it speaks to everything about creativity. You know, there is the blank page and then there's the written word. There is nothing and then there is something. And it's called Genesis, but also because, you know, everything that is good and right about me is because I was born my father's daughter. So I had been, you know, deep into objects and my own photographs for many months, probably pushing a year. And, um, but I had never considered assemblage. And I think mostly because I was really familiar with Joseph Cornell's work. I'd come here from Houston. You can see a lot of his work. They rotate it through the Manila. Um, museum in, in Houston and to see those things in real life, um, I would have never uh, said, wow, you know, I think I'm going to try that. It just was bit really intimidating what I'd seen, but I'd spent all this time kind of in that, you know, this close to that sort of thing. And one morning I got up and I just wanted to try encaustic. And I didn't know a damn thing about how to do encaustic, but I had like a, just a few materials and I thought, well, it's nothing to lose. And I made my first encaustic block and I loved how it felt. I loved how it felt in, in my hand. And I love that it, it, you know, a print is an object, but this felt like this, had, it was different. And immediately I knew it would fit within a certain compartment of this vintage box. And the second that it did, I knew I wasn't going to stop till I gathered all the pieces that felt like, you know, that the, they belong to the same story. And it was pretty thrilling. And again, I got up the next morning and just made it, started working on another assemblage. And that went on for years. I was really mostly doing assemblage. Um, as far as what I was making for easily five years, and I still make them. Um, this one's winter solstice. But I also really love, I think the thing that lit me up about it, particularly, is um, uh, it feels like it fires a different part of my brain. 
while I'm making. It is a puzzle. Um, there's a lot of problem solving. Once you solve the puzzle, well, how do you make it fit so that it's actually a lasting piece? That's a challenge. But I think my favorite thing is that there are all of these elements that are pretty much all of the metaphorical that you know that you choose for this piece and um whether it's the texture is it seeds is it you know is it vintage somebody's hair this piece is called hurt locker and i haven't read these vials in a long time the vials say anger fear dishonesty prejudice selfishness, gluttony, closed-mindedness, resentment, intolerance. I was probably pissed off at somebody that day, is what I'm guessing. Um, and I work hard to not make the same piece over and over again. That's a pretty big challenge. This one's called intuition. Butterfly House, every time I can find a way to make an assemblage that requires some action from the viewer, that makes me really happy. So I love to hide a node in a compartment inside. Um, I love the way, you know, if it's got a door that you have to open the door, if it's a lidded box that you have to open it. And, and I like to, you know, put things in there that they may never see, but I know they're in there forever. Empty nest. This one's garter belt. So, mm -hmm. the current work, the project that I'm working on right now, Blessed Unrest, and I would suspect that most of you are familiar with the quote, the wonderful quote by Martha Graham that I'm completely fixated on. I've written it on, in Sharpie on gallery walls for shows. These chairs, I covered the upholster with the writing so I needed to work something out with Blessed Unrest and I might as well give it a go photographically, but I'm gonna read it to you real quick. There is a vitality, a life force, a, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. If you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not yours to determine how good it is nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep the channel open. You do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. No artist is ever pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. There is only a queer divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. I can usually not get through those last two sentences there without getting choked up because it may, it's comforting to me. Um, and so with this work, I really want to photograph what it feels like to be an artist. The highs, the lows, the loneliness, the connection, the you know, heartbreak, the wonder. And when I'm using a human as a subject, I, I, it's uh, someone who is also a creative. So um, they may not define themselves as an artist, but they are creative. And I'm gonna show you this in rapid fire slideshow form because this is a, um, a work that is unresolved and it's discombobulated and it's an unstable idea at the moment. So that's how this is gonna feel. Y'all hang with me.
Okay, I hope y'all are still with me. Installations. I love installation. I want to be excited about that. Um, I love, love, love. Um, I love alternative venues. Um, there's been shows in, you know, partially restored mansions. This one was in New Orleans. Um, and even in a more traditional space, I try hard to um, take a non-traditional twist with it. I'm, this was in a sanctuary. I want to be brave in the way I ask people to experience my photography. And I, I don't want them to just look at it. I want them to have an experience like I want them to it's an, it's a happening this was at my house I'll come back to that in a minute this is um, a show where every single piece the uh, viewer had to engage with for them to fully realize the piece slide of hand and sometimes it's just a matter of like really you know using the space and I've done a couple of installations for other artists as well um, and I can tell you with the crazy ideas, it is, there is never a show where there is not something bizarre going on um, when you're trying to make something crazy happen. So this was, we were doing the show at my house, Tama Hotbaum and Mary O'Hare were doing it with me. We took all the furniture out of the house. And this is where we're stringing up three working chandeliers over the nest that will be on at night for the show. And that's the kind of crazy stuff that goes on. But, uh, but the coolest thing around that show, we tried lots of stuff, but my favorite thing was we sent video, a series of video invitations to our guests and I'm going to share with you the first one. Which brings us to Kindred. Um, and I think the best way for you to experience Kindred is just for me to start. Kindred was a one night only exhibition last year in Savannah. It was the brainchild of Toby and Macro. 
she had a gutted house she was about to sell, which we lovingly referred to as the shitty yellow house on B Road. But before she sold it, she wanted to do an exhibition. And here's the remarkable, generous part of this. She could have done a solo exhibition. She had done it before and crushed it. But she wanted to use this space for the last time to introduce some artists to her Savannah community. And she asked me, Don Surratt, and Sal Taylor Kidd. And it was an incredible collaboration um, and an amazing experience. This film is by the brilliant artist Addison Brown. And the exhibition and this film represent what I believe is really a movement in how we as artists take care of ourselves and take care of each other. We have to stop giving away our power and only stop lying to ourselves and each other about these antiquated, unattainable definitions of success in the art world. The paradigm shift starts with us and I don't just want to be in the conversation. I want to be a stand for the artist being in full control of our own work and careers. We have to lift each other in every way possible to not only make the best work we can make, but to thrive in sustainable I saw today that you had made something beautiful, and I knew what it had cost you, that beauty. Too much, almost, for one person to contain. It was only yesterday that we wrote of the dreary now of waiting. The spark to break the heavy spell. I'm trying to see the road to there from here, I said. Let's leave now, he replied. The better there. Thank you. 
All right, gang. That's my jam. How'd I do, Eileen? Oh, you only showed us just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Jace, if are you done with the presentation, Lori? You can stop screen sharing if you are. Okay. Stop share. Yeah. Okay, it's you and me, babe. No, oh, no, but it's not off. Wait, yeah, I know what I need off. to do. It is off. Not for me, though. Oh, I got it. Now I'm good. Okay. There you go. Wow. I mean, I. I'm a little speechless. I've seen a lot of this before, but it is, it's profound. And one thing that came to my mind immediately about the installation work is how far in advance do you start working on something? And do you have a sense of the space that you're working with? The space is like the, uh, it's, I don't think I, maybe a couple of times I've been forced to, plan a show without me having been in the space yet but man i fight hard against that and don't, I, you don't even need to send me your floor plans because it will be a sideways glance i i will fly and get to wherever i need to get to to actually walk through the space and get a sense of it the measurements aren't the the most important thing it's about what what what's possible so I was looking at that skirt, incredible photo skirt. I don't know if that's yours or not. Is it was collaborative. It was, um, it was me, Topia, Dawn, and Sal Taylor Kid, And it was all of our images and they were all encaustic. Um, oh my God. And there was probably, we, we, ne we, uh, we got so tired that we're not sure. It's between 900 and 1200 photographs. But did you, put that together like moments before the installation? No, we were, I, I worked on that idea here at my house and I thought I had a plan. Of course, everything, you know, you adjust your sales a bit here and there, but, but it was a solid enough to get us started and went down there about a month before and we gave it a good go. We figured out what we needed to do to finesse it. And that took, week so yeah it was it was actually that was probably hmm, maybe five weeks six six weeks easily for the dress card wow yolanda is her name <laughs> okay let's back up a little bit uh mm -hmm. you are from texas but you sound very southern so were you born in southern texas i lived in southeast texas which is you know on the louisiana border um, for most of my life and but I was in Houston for the last 25 years. I can tell you at 15 I sounded far more su Southern than this. Were you in Keith Carter territory? Yeah, he lived literally over the bridge from me. So I mean maybe seven minutes Uh-huh and then moving to North Carolina uh, Was that as an adult? Yes, and uh, so I lived in Texas all my life, but I had struggled with certain elements of it. And I don't know if it really had anything to do with Texas or just me, but I knew always that I would leave. I can remember knowing clearly at 14, no matter what, I will be, I will move. And uh, it took me a while because we've just been here 13 years. So I was in my early 40s when we moved here. But you know, when my husband asked, when we decided we were getting married, I just said, you just got to know I'm going to be leaving Texas. So I'm leaving with or without you, but I will be leaving. And I handpicked this. He was working kind of remotely or, or um, on a plane. So he said, you can pick any place. We reached a point where it made sense in, in the kind of work he was doing. And I said, can we actually go? And he said, you can pick any place in the continental U.S. that you want to go to. 
as long as there's an airport that we can get to in reasonable time. And in a year, we were living in Chapel Hill. And it was much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. If you're not, if you're not, you know, a savvy kind of at relocating, and I wasn't, um, it was much harder. But it's been the right decision for us. I really love it here. And I feel lit up like a kid. I mean, just about fall. People get sick of me talking about it. And I always think, well, that's too bad because I'm not going to stop talking about it. I get, I cry every time it snows. I, you know, can't believe fall happens. Every time your eye gets comfortable and then, and then you kind of stop seeing it, the whole, it's just like the whole thing changes and it's fantastic. You know, I look at your work and living in California, I could not make that work. And I look at the, the, how much the Southern landscape and the flora and fauna um, really are a, a part of your photo narrative. And I can feel the humidity in some yes. of the photographs and feel the moss and hear the cicadas and like feel the presence of the South in your work. And uh, I'm a little jealous because uh -huh. I can photograph a palm tree and a beach but it's, it's never going to have that soul that your work evokes. Yeah, yours is just a different soul, girl, so don't throw it like that. No, <laughs> yours is just a different soul. It's just, there is just such beauty to the South. Oh, well, I mean, I feel it too. And, you know, I didn't know I was going to, I didn't know it was going to be about the South. I thought Texas was the South, but, te but this, is, this is very different um very different and it inspires me and i'm in the woods you know several times a week depends on what's going on in life sometimes i'm there every single day and the woods are and, and this is walking distance from my house this is five minutes from my house but there are trails everywhere and all of that inspires me but it also centers me like that's it's, you know, safekeeping was my first focus pro project. I almost called it Where God Lives because I was shooting it all in the forest, really. And I thought, I don't want to even deal with all the buttons I'm going to push or whatever. But that's what it feels like. It's the most centering place. And the fact that I have access to it has done great things for me. So yesterday we were chatting a little bit and... First of all, I feel like we have very similar paths to photography. We came to it without an education. We came to it without a community. We came to it photographing our children as the beginnings of our making our work. And um, for me, it's just so wonderful to see your early work again and to see sort of the well of who you are and what you were drawing from. But we were talking a little bit about success. And I think it's mm -hmm. an important conversation to have as artists. And um, I have always felt like with success, there is no, no there there. That the success of achievements never is the same as the success of the making of the work. Gosh, no. And I wanted to talk to you about that. And I was, I wrote this down in your lecture. You said, I don't want to be a conversation. I want to be a statement. That was a powerful line that you, so talk to me about what is success to you. Oh, gosh. Well, I have been wrestling with that for, um, you know, the last 10 years. And, and early on, I was um, very clear. It, it blows my mind when I say this out loud now, but I was very clear that I was going to follow the traditional path um, and the and what defines success to not just artists, but to museum curators and collectors and 
those, you know, people with power look at, look at that um, traditional model. And that's still true today, I think. And I wanted to know if I was good enough, if I was willing to work my ass off, which I do, and I, and I am, and I can, I wanted to know if I could be good enough to be successful in the same way that anybody I admired who had come for me had been successful. And I was really hell bent on it. And, and to be perfectly honest, I, I felt like I was, I had some level of that and it would, I never took it for granted. It would, I mean, anytime anything great like that happened, once, you know, a strong gallery asked, to sign me and you've got the solo show. I mean, I would cry for, you know, a day, just cried that I can't believe this is really gonna happen. And what I just discovered over time was that there was a massive amount of disappointment in that, a massive amount of disappointment. And disappointment's the kind word, actually. You know, there were times where it, actually broke my heart where I cannot believe that that ended that way, that that happened that way, that, that everything that I thought was, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me is actually, it's, it's over like that because I insist on being paid. And it was just so foul. And so by the end of it all, the real end, I thought, I hate art. I hate people who make art. I hate the business of art. I hate talking about art. I just thought, I am so out of here. Because I gave it all. And that was it. It was, you know, it was ugly. And it wasn't just once. And and it wasn't because I wasn't working hard. Um, and then, you know, this totally bizarre, and I don't have to talk about this long, but I was really devastated. And I thought, wow, everything I've wanted is over and I, I don't make art anymore. Um, and I spent time by myself and I cried a lot. And then, my kids decided they were through with the trampoline in the backyard, which had been an eyesore in my backyard for like 15 years. I'm like, hallelujah, we moved the trampoline out. And there's this big space and it's kind of elevated in the backyard. And I was trying to think, well, what could I do with that? That would be cool. And I really wanted a fire pit, but I didn't have any money. And I, so I thought, I wonder if you could build a giant bird. I wonder if it's hard to build a giant bird's nest. I think my husband said, well, Google it. And I'm like, I'm not going to, mama birds don't Google it. They just get started. <laughs> so I did. And it started looking like I might be able to do it. And I didn't stop for four months. I did it all day, every day. And that nest saved my life because nobody could buy it. Nobody could, nobody could ask for half. Nobody, it made no sense to make it. It's in my yard. Um, I can have coffee with her every morning. And it just felt like this, the physicality of doing it was also difficult. And I could work hard loving her, but also getting that anger off my back. And I am not kidding you, in about four months, that's all I did, but life just started coming back and it was nothing I was chasing because I hated art and everybody in art. Things just started to come that you would never, I would never say no to. I think the um, sanctuary show came and you know that was challenging. I'd never done anything like it. It was beautiful and it was, it was something really different and nothing, slowed down exhibition wise or in my career 
in the slightest way. And it wasn't because I was out there, you know, insisting. It was that I was making work and I was also free. Not free because I got all the time in the world. I think free because I don't, I didn't have to ask anybody's permission to do anything. And, and I, I can sell it how I want to sell it, get paid how I want to, gosh, I think I'm starting to sound mean now. Aren't I? Well, okay. I have a question. Yeah. I, I feel like your way of presenting photographs or photographic art is, was way ahead of the curve. And, um, I, I feel that it is critical as artists right now to take control of our careers and make it happen for ourselves. And you were at the forefront of that. No, you, said, you know, but it's true. Like you said, we're going to have a show. I'm going to do a show with these four people. It's going to be amazing. We're going to make a video of it. We're going to like promote it. And that was not happening before. And, and what you created was so unusual also. It wasn't just five people putting up five frame photos. Um, and uh, right. I can't help but think that when you have the power of the trajectory of your own work, it must be so incredibly exciting and freeing. I think I'm, you know, I think I'm still surprised by it. I think I, I think I tanked so low that um, I didn't think I would ever feel this happy about working again in, in art, but it's actually so much better. I'm not saying there's not pain or self doubt or complications, but I feel powerful is maybe a ridiculous word to keep using over and over again, but I do feel like I have some control over what's going to happen where before I felt like uh, I had to mind my manners, whether you liked it or not. And, and, and fight to be paid and um, there was a lot, there was a lot of rough stuff in that scene. And, um, that's not true now, ever. Yeah. It's funny. I wrote this question. Your work is feminine and it, uh, celebrates women and children, but at the core of it, it has a particular power. And you've just spoken to that. Um, Gosh. Rooted, rooted in the land and the natural world. And I wondered if you had researched indigenous philosophies, because I feel like you are so connected to the earth. And I wondered if you had ever considered how the indigenous population looks at land. I have not. And um that sounds like something I think I would completely love. I tell you, I, I you know, when I, wh where I grew up, we lived on at the end of the a dirt road with no street sign and we were the only house on the street. And my parents weren't really paying attention. And so I, you know, my brother and I would leave in the morning and we would build forts in the woods all day long and they were good and we took those very seriously and then we you know we just come in when it's really dark and you haven't eaten all day and um and that was the only that was the that was a really happy part of my childhood and it felt peaceful I think that was completely the beginning of, cre of me really connecting to the creative part of myself and saying, yes, we need to, you know, dig holes there for shelving for the 
that's going to be amazing and taking brooms out to sweep the forest floor. And so I just think, you know, nature and making, I was doing that from five up. And then when we moved to the city, obviously that was not true. Um, coming here, you know, and uh, traveling so much now to the Barrier Islands for Pigs Fly Retreats with Ann Barry, who's really the one who introduced me to that place. But, you know, now not only am I in the wilderness, literally, but I'm with wild creative people who all pretty much agree, you know, we've got your back for anything you want to try. That's so pretty much our jam. Let's back up and tell us what Pigs Fly Retreat is. So it's the um, it's a retreat that uh, that Ann Barry and I started, and in I bet everybody knows her work and her art. But she's an amazing artist, and she and I met in Ireland ten years ago. And I knew I was going to make her be my friend. I was going to keep her because she was smart as a whip and super understated. And I thought, I know you're cool. Uh, and I feel better about myself because nobody else here is maybe thinking that, but I totally know it. And I was right. And she, she had really spent 20 years going to um, Osaba and Cumberland and Sapelo and these barrier islands are, you know, they're the wilderness with, um, with, um, some of the, the, every island's got a different family history. The family history is fascinating too. And so she, I went with her, um, we've taken a couple small groups and, but, and we started talking about this idea of doing a retreat and she and I were kind of the last two standing. We'd talked about it with a few people and, but she and I were the ones that showed up to really plan it and it's like, it totally changed my life because she's, she's the best partner I could possibly have. Um, I think we bring different strengths, which helps us a lot. So um, what I can't manage, she can and vice versa. And you know, in the early days, I was often asked at portfolio reviews, well, what do you think you'll do when your children grow up? And I think I was always a little offended by the question because, one, well, I, but I didn't know. But I thought the implication was you can only make a picture of your children. And it makes you wonder if that might be true. Well, my children aren't so interested in, in it these days. I can still snag Olivia every now and then, but my children are not so interested. But I am with artists that I admire and look up to and who are all up in that scene with anyone, anyone getting started with an idea anywhere on these islands. You know, they'll the, the groups just gather around and dig in and contribute and dress up and hold your gear and it's just a very supportive environment so um we do it at least once a year um obviously right now this is tricky business but we've done it on Osaba and cumberland and the we really really important uh, it's important to us that we state this um, at every welcome lunch that our intention is it'd be lovely if you make great pictures, but that's not our intention. Our intention is also not to teach you anything. We're all learning from each other. So that would be an accident, but it's not our, we're not out to do that. What we want is to crack you open creatively, um, that you leave here connected to the strongest part of yourself and hopefully hang on to that for as long as you can, and that you leave connected to the people that you've just had this experience with. And that it seems to be working really well. Um, 
we are there there's an audience coming to us that is exactly what works so i'm really grateful for it yeah it seems like also in the last five or six years that a lot of your curatorial efforts and your output is collaborative with other people mm. and um that's so exciting i just think there is power in the in a collective in a group i know your your group changes each time but um as again this is a gesture of the artist taking the power and well and that's the that's the remarkable thing because the solo show nobody's gonna deny that a solo show feels um it's quite a life moment um but to do something difficult and a little bit crazy and wild with a small group of people that you trust completely um and for it to be successful and for you to be lifted and supported by them i've been the one being lifted and supported what that means to me you know I, they mother me through whatever you know is falling apart and happening and that what's better than that yeah exactly well maybe what's better than that is music <laughs> <laughs> well there's always music everywhere so i have actually seen you perform twice once oh god it, if that was at slow exposures i would have been terrible so, but once in north carolina also and you and tama put on oh, at castle show. house yes and well, that would be um, for that. you were so uh you know, if I had to get up and perform in front of a group of people, uh, well, that would not happen anyway. So, um, but you were just, you, you were just such a natural and, uh, did Let me tell you, I would not be holding an instrument or singing a note of anything ever in public if it weren't for Tama Hawkbaum. Like she's really, um, I was, you know, I was dinking around, very seriously dinking on the guitar and trying really hard to get good. And she contacted me. She had sent me a few notes over Facebook. I hadn't lived here for that long. I, I hadn't had the guitar for very long either. And she, she kept trying to get us together for lunch and something would come up and one or the other would cancel. And then I think Dennis Keel came in town and, and I posted a picture that he had spent the night and there was a picture of us playing guitar and Tama sends a note the next day and says, Hey, I see that you play guitar. I play guitar too. Girl, we were scheduled with our guitars the next day and we've not been apart since. And it's huge part of my well-being and she says that's true for her too but she is good and she inspires me to be better but she also teaches me to be better and um just playing with someone stronger than you you know elevates you period but it is you know to get this age and get to have crazy fun like that with a girlfriend that you trust and we just can rock it out in my kitchen. We say, you know, what's going to be better than this this week? Like nothing. Yeah. It was, it's a blast. Well, I, I can attest that you guys are pretty great. And in Thank you. a lot of your videos have music or maybe they all do. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I can I, yeah, I care about they the music. They're really a big part of your narrative. And, Very um, much so. Yeah. So who and what inspires you? Um, for sure, I would say generous, humble, hardworking artists. 
I like those characteristics in my artist friends. Um, that's a biggie. They'll take me along and teach me anything or show up for me. The people who showed up for me to help me figure something out here would make me cry if I actually started telling you the story. And it's been a while, but you know, the, the, it's, that is real mothering and um, that has meant the world. So that inspires me. It makes me always want to be better. Um, well, I don't want to be schmaltzy, but, but, but I'm a big fan of the nature. You know, I, that's, um, I can spend a whole lot of time with a lot of ideas just by being up in it, you know, and I've been messing around with this thing since quarantine that, um, you know, I, 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 someone had given me, it's a long story that I'll save you, but someone had given me this vintage set of actual specimens. They're not painted spec botanical specimens. They're the specimens attached to the, to the old paper. And they're from the Hawaiian Islands and they're from the 50s. And this woman had died, but she was a marine biologist. And they're playful and beautifully attached. And from the 50s and they're perfect. And I have like 50 of them. And I was organizing them in quarantine and only a few had come dislodged, but the dislodged ones were in perfect condition. I thought, my God, you could do a million things with these. It would be just like laying the bird wings on the print. I thought, oh my God. Well, I didn't want to look at my prints. I didn't want to deal with, I didn't, I'm tired of them. And I thought, well, I really want to do it. I just started laying them on my face and making self-portraits that, and they're called renegade specimens, which um, I wanted that to be a little open-ended, but, um, so I've been doing that for 12 days, I think, and I'm challenged to do one a day, and that feels, you know, totally connected to, it's not about the selfie, I wish it were anybody but me, but I'm the one that's willing, and I'm here, um, I'm available. So nature in a huge way, music in a huge way. Um, memory for sure. So I just wanna to say to the audience, we're gonna wrap up our conversation in a bit. So if you have questions, now's the time to add them to the Q and A. Um, I'm going to ask you five questions and I want you to give me one word answers. Um, this me? is, a, yeah. So this is a little bit like inside the actor's studio. Oh gosh, am I ready? Well, it's, they're so easy. Favorite musician. Okay. I'm just going to bite it and say, la, well, love it. Favorite destination? Oh, sorry, I gotta be faster. Any ocean. Favorite movie? Out of Africa. Favorite cocktail? Filthy, dirty, vodka martini. And I wish you would bring me one right now. I know. Finally, favorite cuss word. You know what it is, babe. I don't. <laughs> yeah, fuck. Oh, I think mine is asshole. <laughs> All right. But, I, but I'm fond of many of them. But yeah. you know, if you gotta, if you gotta go for it. Well, I find very effective while I'm driving. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. And Did I talk too much, Aileen? No. We're here to listen to you talk. Oh my so, God, uh, but I, you know. Okay, I I... we have a few questions. Okay. Uh, 
Matthew Finley, a wonderful photographer, says, what programs do you use to create your videos? Um, the one I've been happy with lately is called Video Leap. None of these are fancy, by the way, which you could probably tell, but they are, so I don't have any of the high-end stuff. iMovie, I'm tired of being mad at iMovie, so Video Leap seems to be solving most of my problems. So what I like is there's a lot of options in Video Leap, and then if there's a little tweaking thing, I'll export it out of Video Leap and then run it through iMovie to fade out to black or something stupid like that. So, uh, but that's it. Those are the only two that I use right now. So, uh, Amy McCory says, I think your work is so extraordinary. I find the films you make mesmerizing and I am so curious how you do them. I'm from Houston. I wish we, I had met you. Be I'll be back. Be glad you left Houston when you did. <laughs> no. You couldn't leave now. So no one wants a Texan right now. <laughs> but can you um, share a little bit into the process of making your videos? Is that what she said? Uh, well, I only use my phone. And yep. I, yeah. Yeah, well, that is how, that's how not a filmmaker I am. But you know what? It's always on me. And my friend Kent Corley, great artist, keeps saying, Verba, you know, I think you're ready for your digital camera. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ready yet. So I'm filming with my phone. I was going to ask you if you are a all film person still, which I am too. I'll film, but you know, I shoot with my phone all the time for social media and I enjoy that very much. It's just kind of a little different in my mind, but that's good for me that it is different in my mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Ian Wright has asked, what kind of music do you play and does it connect to your other work? Um, I think it would not surprise him that um, our work, you know, I always sing with Tama. Um, I play stuff on my own. When, if I'm playing on my own, I'm probably going to play some bluesy stuff she wouldn't gravitate to maybe so much. And I would probably do some gospel she would not gravitate to. But when she and I are together, we do a lot of folk-ish, little rockabilly. I think would be a good, some singer songwriter stuff, but, um, but it's feminine for sure. We look for things that resonate with us. Like we, we love the words. So it's an extension for sure. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about when you were talking about building the nest, how I think as a culture, we have been so removed to the tactile quality of making yeah. it all on a digital screen we're not and you know they there's a lot of conversation about how important it is for our fingers to touch things and how that really sparks creative thinking and i was thinking as you were building that nest how it that was amazing was, yeah yeah no it was amazing and you know, you couldn't even get in my way. And I, and I, you know, I cleared out all of the yards of anything that was usable. And, um, and then I had to just get my car and I had like a midsize SUV, but it was lots of places where I could get to big woods in my area where there'd be a place I could park. But then I'd have to haul all the stuff and I would completely fill the back of the SUV and have to drive with the hatch all the way up and drag it all out into my backyard and then assemble it. And so, no, it's good hard work, but it is for the mama bird too, you know? Did your, what did your neighbors think? Um, nobody, Nobody's made fun of me. I think, you know, I think the sweetest thing was um, an older woman that lives across the street. Uh, 
they were clearing something out of the yard and I went and asked her if I could have it. And she said, why would you want that? And I said, well, I've been building a nest in my backyard. She said, I've been wondering what you were doing. And I said, well, do you want to come see? And she said, sure. And she kept standing, shaking her head. And she said, you know, sometimes you just have no idea what somebody that, <laughs> you know, is right there. And you built, you know, and because the nest is huge. Yeah. It's not like, it's not, it's not a child nest. It's, it's it can hold several nest. people. Okay. We could have cocktails in the nest. <laughs> okay. So, Cresha Lucasen, hi, Cresha, um, says, I love the image of the person in the doorway creating the shadow with the cross. It speaks oh. to me on a few levels. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that came, image came to be? So um, there is a, a place on Cumberland Island, which is where we do pigs fly retreats. And it is the first Southern Baptist African-American church. Amber is going to correct me if I'm wrong. She'll probably type it in because it's very specific, but it was the very first of its kind. Maybe she'll type that in. Um, and it's where John F. K. Jr. got married to um, Carolyn Bissett. And it is awe-inspiring. I mean, you feel something because it's so primitive and it is so tiny and it's so sparse, but it feels like it's looked exactly like that. Like it's not in disrepair, but it's so primitive still. And it just, it really gets your full attention. And um, it was, you know, it was just a blazing, sunny, crazy day where it's hard to get a picture out there, but that's Deb Schwedtown who was on our retreat and she stepped into the door and, and the, the um, altar and the podium has a bent stick cross. And so I just got by behind that cross focused on her, but knew she'd be blown out, but was hoping that cross would just do something vague in there. And, and it worked, but that was pretty exciting. But sometimes you go there and you think, I can't, you know, when some places is, is really moving in that way, sometimes I think it takes several trips because it's overwhelming. Yeah. So Becky Griffin has asked, oh. Hi, Lori. Is tomorrow your birthday? Oh, you are such a hoe for doing that. <laughs> Happy birthday, Lori. She's my best friend, and she knows that would piss me off that she did that. Well, and you. Anyway, happy birthday. Thank you. And I've been telling everybody I was going to be 55. My husband told me a few days ago I'm going to be 56, and I'm actually going to be 56. Like, what the hell? Well, you can't stop time. No, but I just would like to know how old I am. I guess. Well, we're, we're as old as we feel. Yeah, well, then I'm probably all right. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and then I really want to end with talking about your upcoming workshop because... We are so excited to have you come to LACP, but let me ask, uh, let me find it. Um, Rohina, hi Rohina, uh, says, Lori, I love your work and your honesty about speaking about it. I am curious, do you incorporate writing into your process at all? Um, I do, and I used to, you know, I, I admired, I loved and respected and admired my dad so much. And so I kind of pride myself on the fact that I think I'm a decent writer and I actually enjoy doing it. I just used to do it a lot more than I do now, but there's always some part of whatever I'm making. You know, when I was getting ready to, to do the monograph, I love titling anything. And I, you know, I just sat on the front porch and just kind of tried to get peaceful and just write down 
every word or combination of words that would feel like what I wanted the book to be. And I remember my daughter came out and she said, well, read me some of them. And I got to one that said warm butter. And she said, warm butter. And I said, yeah, like, wouldn't that feel good? And she's like, you are nothing like warm butter. <laughs> You're nothing like warm butter. Um, but I just think it's a helpful tool for me. And just like you were saying, Aileen, Aileen were you saying that it was about writing, that was the, no, just a tactile thing. Yeah. And to me, you know, when I was getting ready to do this, I would never type my thoughts because the pencil to the paper is like a direct line to my head. And it doesn't mean that I have it all completely memorized, but it's pretty close. If I'll just write out every word. And um, that sticks for me. And then, yeah, mapping things out for sure. Just writing down ideas and trying combinations. But, um, but I'm a, I love the pencil, not the pen. And I'm, I'm not a very good typist. So I, I, I don't like typing things out anymore. So the pencil's my... Okay, so I am going to promote your class. It starts on September 12th. It's four sessions. And uh, the workshop is about big ideas for expanding how we think about and pursue viable careers in the photographic arts. She examines her radical shift from the traditional no notions of fine art success to what is now considered a guerrilla movement in the exhibition, curatorial, and marketing arenas. And um, the description goes on. You can find it on the website. But is there anything you want to say about the workshop that um, you're excited about sharing or passing on to? Um, well, I hope people are um, not disappointed that we are not going to be gathering in LA because I think this could be really effective. Um, in the way we've set it up. Um, so yeah, it's like two, it's like a three hour session on a Saturday, three hour session on a Sunday, and the same thing the next weekend. And, you know, it's ultimately about your community anyway, um, and how to get things moving or connect. I mean, that's a big part of the class. Um, you know, I, I want to be clear and I hope this doesn't actually scare anyone off, but I don't think it will. I mean, I really have fought against the notion of teaching or even the title or thinking about it that way because I don't feel um, like I know something you don't. I just maybe have had some experiences that you want to hear about. And that's how I like to look at it. And I, and I have had some of those experiences and I tell the truth to artists. And I think that um, that's going to be worthwhile. Well, it sounds like a four days of creative thinking, which is yeah. the best. Right. So, well, my friend, we are at the end of the road and I am uh, delighted to celebrate you and have you share your amazing work with our audience and um, wish you continued wonderful successes. And most importantly, have a kick-ass birthday tomorrow. Uh, we'll all be thinking of you. So. Thank you. Aileen, you swooped in here and just made my freaking day. So I'm serious. You know, I think the world of you, you are only out there doing big, beautiful things for all of us. And you've been doing it before anybody was even thinking about doing it. So for you to come sit down with me, thank you so much. Thank you. My great pleasure. And Jason, I guess you are 
Jason rocked it hard. Jason's a fellow Texan, by the way. He was eating a pork it's chop true. right before we started. Hey, hey, why are you calling me up? <laughs> Uh, on behalf of LACP, I want to say thank you to both of y'all for being here and doing this. And I want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, I hope you learned a lot and were inspired to keep making work, especially in this scary, scary, strange time. Uh, and I think most importantly, uh, keep talking to each other and let's keep these dialogues going. That's the most important thing. You know, we're all kind of.